Well, good morning, friends. Hey, this is Brother Mike. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for last week. I was in uh, Kansas City holding a deliverance service at the community center there in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, my flight flight issues and so on, I was on an airplane at the time. I was supposed to be doing my podcast. So I posted it on my Facebook, but I apologize if you didn't get the message. That would be uh, all my fault on that one. Hope you'll forgive me. I'm back and I'm happy to be back. Uh, please remember that um, at the Arizona Deliverance Center, we have a, a staff of counselors that are available to help you. There's no charge if you're a born again Christian. All you have to do is call the ministry line, 602-636-5800 and I'll get you on the counseling schedule. Counseling and deliverance services are available. They're no, they're no charge. Also, we have two live services every week, Thursday and Friday nights at the Deliverance Center. We're on 15th Avenue, just south of Osborne Road. It's the Red Brick Building. And we have two Zoom services every week. Mondays is for the ladies at um, 6.30, and Wednesdays is for everybody at 6 o'clock. All you have to do is send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the code and the password, and you'll be ready to go for the Zoom services. I hope you'll take advantage of them. In every single service, God answered, <clears throat> answered my prayers years ago. Every day during my devotionals, I asked him for a counseling ministry and a healing and inner healing and deliverance ministry, and God answered my prayers. And the main prayer was, that during every live service, the Holy Spirit would move. And um, it's been the number one prayer request I've ever received. Literally in every service, the Holy Spirit moves. Whether I'm there or not doesn't matter. Whoever's there, the Holy Ghost moves. And the reason I prayed that prayer years ago was because I had come out of the Assembly of God denomination and there was a lot of good stuff about this Assemblies of God, met a lot of great people and so on. But there were a lot of times, most of the time, actually, we had services at the Assembly of God where the Holy Spirit did not move. And that really bothered me. And I began to envision or fantasize, what would it be like if the Holy Spirit moved at every single service, if there was some move of the Spirit at every service? And that's how I came up with that idea. And I prayed and asked God to give it to me. And he did. Every single Thursday and Friday night, every single Zoom service, Holy Ghost moves. Holy Spirit moves. Every single service. For years now, years, I started the ministry in 2004. Every single service, the Holy Spirit moved. It's, a bit, it's been amazing. So you can expect that to happen if you come to Zoom or if you come see us live. Doesn't matter. This Friday, I'm having a seminar on the invisible world. And I wanted to give you a uh, kind of a taste of it today. If you don't mind, I'm going to share just a couple of things of what I'll be sharing Friday. I got dozens of things to share Friday with you, but everybody. Every born-again Christian, for sure, and almost every human being understands and knows either here or here in their mind or in their heart, they know there is a spirit world. Almost everybody knows it. People who have PhDs, people in the science field, no, they, they don't know that. But those are the only idiots that don't know it. Every normal person trust me, knows there's something out there. There is an invisible world. Everybody knows it. There's no question about it. Everybody's kind of experienced it. If you've ever experienced sleep paralysis, whether you're saved or not, that is a human being interacting with the invisible world. There's an invisible world out there, isn't there? Check this out. When the Apostle Paul was living the life of a serial killer, 
he was uh, arresting and murdering and imprisoning Christians because he thought he was doing God's service. Remember that? Well, you also remember precisely his, uh, his conversion on the Damascus Road. And it said he heard a voice and he fell out of his chariot. And Paul said in verse 15, Acts 26, verse 15, he said, who are you, Lord? The reason he called him Lord was because he had seen a gigantic flash of light and something blew him out of his chariot onto the ground. And he's on, his, on the ground on all fours. And so he says, who are you, Lord? Well, this was, this was someone from the invisible world contacting someone in the visible world. And the Bible says, says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And of course, he wasn't persecuting Jesus per se, but when you persecute Jesus's followers, you're persecuting Christ by extension, right? So that when people, for example, in Nigeria, uh, they're murdering Christians in droves there. The Muslims are killing them off left and right. They're not committing murder against people. They're committing murder against Christ. And then Jesus says to Paul, while he's being converted, he says, rise up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. One, to make you a minister. Two, to make you a martyr. What is a uh, martus? A martus is a martyr, someone who dies for their faith. Jesus told Paul the first day he met him that he was going to die for his faith. He was going to be a martyr. And uh, he said, I want you to die for the things which you have seen. Those are the things that are visible and those things in which I will appear to you. Those were the things that were going to happen to him in the future, which were at that time invisible. And I will deliver you from the people and the nations, Jesus said to him, whom I now send you. And I'm sending you there to one, verse 18, one, open their eyes. Two, to turn them from darkness to light. Three to turn them from the authority of Satan to the authority of God so that they may, four, receive forgiveness of sins, and five, an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Amazing. Now, you know what sanctification is, right? Hagiazo means to separate or set aside. You as a born-again Christian have been set aside to glory. Hagiazo, sanctified, to set something aside. You could sanctify a chair, you could sanctify a church, you could sanctify a person, what have you, depending on what you're doing, and so on. But sanctification means to set something aside, and that's what you are. To God, you have been set aside by God as a born-again Christian for glory, for heavenly glory. <laughs> that's what you've been set aside to. Did you know that? Yeah, that's true. You've been sanctified. Yes, you have. Now, Jesus said something here remarkable because he's talking about an invisible kingdom. There's two of them. There's the kingdom of darkness. There's the kingdom of light. There's two of them in the invisible world. There's not three. You either belong to one or the other. And as you know, the invisible world interreacts, has intercourse with the visible world. The supernatural world connects to, relates to, the natural world. They're together. As you know, the natural world 
is here and the supernatural world, the invisible world is superimposed upon the natural world. So that as I'm speaking to you right now, there are spirit beings in your home now, and there's spirit beings right here in my office here, in addition to me sitting here or you sitting there. The invisible world is superimposed on the natural world. They interconnect. The difference being the invisible world can see us. We can't see them. And there are exceptions, of course, if some, if an angel or something in the invisible world or a demon or God manifests itself in the natural world, then we can see it with our eyes. The Greek word is edu. Edu, I see you. Easy to remember. Edu, I see you. If they don't choose to manifest themselves, we can't see them. I don't see anything right now. I'm sitting in my den talking to you. I don't see anything. Nothing. All I see is the natural world. Like, there's my computer. Here's, the, here's my Emporia State coffee mug. I use it during the winter, not during the summer, it's too hot. The invisible world, however, is as real as the natural world. It's just on a different plane. A couple of examples, real quick. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is talking to the born again Christians. Many of them, or most of them, were his converts. He established a church at Ephesus, and it was a great church, a powerful church. And Paul says to them in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, In times past, you walked according to the course of this world. Ion cosmos is the Greek phrase, and that means the human age. You used to be a part of the human age, and you used to walk in the human age. And number two, he says, you used to walk with the prince of the power of the air. What is he talking about? Well, of course, that's easy to interpret. He's talking about when you and I used to be sinners before we were born again, we walked with Satan unknowingly. Unknowingly. I didn't know anything about this spirit world. I thought it was, you know, a hoax or tradition or something somebody made up. No, there's actually a spirit world. I was wrong when I was living in sin. I didn't understand how that worked. And it says the prince of the power of the air. The Greek word for prince there is archon. It means ruler. And the Greek word for power in that verse in Ephesians is exousia, authority. There's a ruler that has authority in the invisible world, and he travels through the air, which is the Greek word for oxygen or air, literal air that I'm breathing now. That's how spirit beings transition. They move through, they move through the air on the planet Earth, the atmosphere. That's what it's saying. And then in chapter 6, he goes into it in detail. And you know this verse. You've memorized it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against archon, same Greek word, rulers. And exousia, same Greek word, spiritual authorities. And he says, the rulers of the darkness of this world, Greek word, I own age. The rulers of the darkness, kosmokrator, is the Greek word for world rulers there are in the invisible world world rulers of this age that run this planet they're running the planet and it says we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places high places is a greek word eparanius it means the atmosphere that surrounds the earth the atmosphere, right? You got the troposphere, then you've got the stratosphere, right? And then you've got the ozone level, level, 
layer, excuse me, you have the ozone layer. Anything beyond the ozone layer, as far as we know, there is no life anywhere in the universe, as far as we know. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm just saying as far as we know, there's no life whatsoever past the ozone layer on the planet Earth. Once you get out past the stratosphere and hit the ozone layer, after that, everything dies. Everything's dead. Right? There's no life. There's no oxygen. There's no water. Nothing to sustain life as far as we know. I'm not saying it's, they're not out there. I'm just saying we just don't know. So you see Paul here is telling you, hey, there's an invisible world out there. Just like Jesus told him when he was converted on the Damascus Road. There's an invisible world out there, man. And just because you can't see it doesn't make it real. See, I can't see the Eiffel Tower right now, but it's definitely real. I can't see you right now. You're real. You're on my podcast. Thank you for that. Check out Colossians chapter 1. Here, Paul mentions to this church four things, right? He mentions thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Thronos is the Greek word for spiritual thrones or spiritual seats of authority. In the invisible world, there's some kind of a kingdom out there where supernatural beings sit on thrones and they have authority. These are probably fallen angels. I don't know. I'm not sure. But it, to me, in my mind, it is. Then it says, Paul said, there's dominions out there. Curiotis is a Greek word. It means lordships. Once again, somebody in this visible world is in charge of everything. Somebody's running this show. Rulers. Thrones, lordships. Then the other two words, principalities and powers, are the same ones he used in Ephesians. Archon, ruler, and ecstasy of spiritual authorities. Same words. He duplicated them, but he added those other two. So here's what you've learned. There, there's a hierarchy out there in the invisible world. It's all real. It's, it's, it's more real than the natural world. The only difference is we can't see them. They can see us. They can see us. And the goal of the net, of the spirit world, that world, what is the goal of it? To influence and control the natural world. That's what the Holy Ghost is doing seven days a week, 365 days a year. He's trying to influence you in a positive way. Your behavior, your mind, your thoughts, your attitudes, anything. To be like Lord, the Lord Jesus, to be like Christ, to be Christ-minded. The goal in life, our goal in life, is to be like Jesus. And even though we never reach that point where we're exactly like him, that's our goal in this life until the day we die. We want to be more Christ-like and think like Christ thinks. We want to develop, and it takes years to do it, the mind of Christ. You don't just flip a switch and suddenly you think exactly like Jesus. That's not going to happen. But as you grow in grace, as you study the word, as you show yourself approved unto God, your mind transforms into the mind of Christ, right? It's a process of transformation. You're being transformed into the mind of Christ. That's your goal. And in Colossians chapter 1, he said it right there. Jesus has delivered us from the exousia, authority of darkness, and he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The Greek word for dear there is... Agape, and it means loving son. The kingdom of his loving son is what that actually says. For some reason, they translate it as dear. And then it says in Colossians 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood. That's an incredible word uh, for redemption there. Apolutrosis means to be ransomed. God sent the son 
to pay the price that we could be ransomed off not the slavery block like they had in uh, early um, the early portions of the founding of the country when we had slaves. Slaves used to be sold in the marketplace. Everybody was in the marketplace and sold into sin. And the son, Apollutrasus, ransomed us off the sin block by purchasing, it says here, through his blood, Colossians chapter 1, through his blood, he redeemed us, he ransomed us for the forgiveness of sins. That's the Greek word, Ephesus, not the normal Greek word, Ephemi. Ephesus means freedom, to have freedom from sin. That's how we were ransomed or redeemed, through the blood of Christ. Then it says something interesting. Who is the image, Greek word icon, where we get our English word icon. Icon is an image, a statue, a representation. A, something that's similar to something else. Jesus is similar or the image of, of the invisible God. Aoritas is the Greek word. It means something that exists that you can't see. It exists, but you just can't see it with the natural eye. It says he, Jesus is the firstborn of paschatesis is the Greek words. All of creation, okay, which he was. Jesus was the first human being, the first fruits of humanity to be born again. Jesus was the first, Greek word prototokos, the first in line of many others, which includes you and I. We are in the line of the inheritance of Christ, we are born again, washed in his blood, redeemed, set free from the power of sin, and we are in line with Christ at the head, Prototokos. Right? You know, in, in the, in the uh, John 3, 16, it says what? Jesus, God gave his only begotten son, only begotten son. All right, that's not prototokos, that's monogenes. That means a person, a husband and wife, a man and woman, what have you, who only has one child. Are you an only child? Well, then you're like Jesus. Jesus was a monogenes, an only child. Yeah, Jesus was also a prototokos. What was that? The firstborn of Mary. Remember, it says she gave birth to her firstborn child and laid him in a manger. Firstborn, prototokos, means the first of others. We know that Jesus had four brothers. Obviously, they were half-brothers. And an unknown number of sisters. We don't know how many sisters he had. The marriage of Cana was probably his sister. One of the sisters. Yeah. So, monogonase and prototokos are different. And they're used differently in the text. The Catholics, for example, teach that Mother Mary uh, was an eternal virgin and never had any other kids. Well, that's false because the Greek word prototokos means she had Jesus as her firstborn son among others in line. Jesus was the In heaven and on the, the Greek text, it means upon the earth, things that are whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. There you go. It was created, Greek word dia, through him and ice into him. Everything went through him and into him. 
what's going on here. There's an invisible world out there that's trying to affect you personally. The invisible world, the invisible world wants to connect with the visible world and control it. The Holy Spirit wants to control you, but he'll only do it if you allow him to. Demons and fallen angels, they want to control humanity by force. And they will do anything to do it. Steal, kill, destroy, lie, doesn't matter what it is. Anything. They'll do anything to control the natural world. Anything. But the Holy Spirit will not. He only works with volunteers, people who willingly submit to his control. And people who do that are shocked to see the benefits of the living Christ and the power of the living Christ, all contained in the personhood of the Spirit of God. Everybody wants to control everybody else. Right? Everybody the control freak. Well, demons are control freaks. They want to control you. And the number one method of controlling you is what? Putting thoughts in your mind. That's our number one method of control. Number one. The Holy Spirit puts things in your mind, but only if you give him permission to do it. Okay? That's happened to me, I don't know how many times, I couldn't even count on how many times. Particularly when I was, you know, having a teaching session or something. A thought will pop into my mind that I wasn't planning on using it, didn't, wasn't even thinking about it. A thought pops in my mind and I share it and it ties right into what I was teaching. Beautiful. Demons don't do that. They try to put thoughts in your mind, whether you want them or not, doesn't matter. And then God leaves it up to you whether you're going to keep that thought from the invisible world. Like I said, this Friday of the seminar, I'll be going over so much more about the invisible world than this. You know, fantastic insights Friday. Uh, go to youtube.com slash house of healing AZ. Man, I've got the goods for you this Friday. You won't believe the, the text. It's really quite fascinating. Demons put thoughts in your mind. They just shoot them in there. They're allowed to do it. Second Corinthians chapter four. They control people using thoughts. Okay. Adolf Hitler didn't come up with the ovens. Come on. The demons put those thoughts into my hand. And here's the best way. Let's, let's kill six million Jews. Okay. How are we going to do that? And the demons just pump the thoughts in Hitler's head. Listen, here's how we can do them. We'll, We'll load them on trains. We'll take them by force. We'll shut down their businesses. We'll ship them to concentration camps. We'll build ovens. We'll, we'll kill them all with poison gas. We'll tell them we're going to, they're going to get a shower. Okay, we're going to ship everybody into the gas warehouse where they claim their showers in there. And the gas comes out. People die. We're going to load them into the ovens. And we're going to incinerate them. That Hitler never came up with that. No, that did not happen. That's not human. Only the devil kills like that. Nobody else kills like that. There's no way. That came right from him. He put those thoughts in their head. And he told them, hey, listen, this is how we kill, kill Jews. Let's go get them. And throw in the gypsies and the disabled people, too. They're no good either. They didn't just come up with that on their own. Absolutely not. The stupid, ignorant, asinine, imbecilic thoughts that you have in your life, you didn't come up with those on your own. You're getting some help. What do you think you are, an idiot? Oh, far from it. You're not an idiot. You're not a moron. Now, you act like it and talk like it sometimes. Yeah, but only after they put stupid thoughts, lies, 
falsehoods, fabrication into your mind. And then only after you agree with it and receive it. Yeah. Now, if you keep doing that repetitively over and over again and you mix in smoking pots, smoking crystal meth, smoking crack, taking hallucinogens, you will get powerful spirits in your brain, severe schizophrenia, disassociate, DID, disassociations, hallucinations, psychoses. And then you are in real trouble. Okay. Yeah, you're not a normal person anymore. You've got an entity in your head. But entities only get in under special circumstances. They can't just take people. Schizophrenia demons are super smart. They got massive IQs. They're like demons on steroids. They can't just take people. Yeah, be sure your sin will find you out. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. You've got to open the door and practically pull those kind of demons into your head by taking drugs and, you know, living in horrible sin. You go smoke crack or crystal meth. Hey, dude, it, you hung yourself. You're dead in the water. Suddenly you're going to hear not just thoughts in your head. You're going to hear voices in your head. Voices. You're going to start seeing things. Seeing things. Wow. And then when that happens, you can hear them clear as a bell. Sometimes they're outside your head. Sometimes they're in your mind. You can hear them as clear as a bell. And so at the Deliverance Center, at a hardcore Christianity, what we do is explain to people that you've got to take these thoughts captive in your mind, 2 Corinthians 10. And if you don't do that, the condition is going to get worse. So here's how it works. Once a spirit puts a thought in your mind, if he sees you take it, he'll put another one in. If he sees you take that, he'll put another one in. Boom. To give you an idea how crazy this is, just this week this happened to me. A family came in to see me for counseling. Husband, wife, and a son. And the husband had, had come down with uh, schizophrenia from uh, smoke and crack. Pretty routine. I'm explaining to the husband that his level of faith, which was here, that's a good thing. It's not good enough to get that entity out of his brain now. He's got a schizophrenia demon in his forehead, right here in the frontal lobe. And I said, your faith level is here. It's not good enough to get that demon out of there. You get, it's got to go here. It's got to go way up. We have got to get you to increase your faith to get that level of spirit out of your brain. Yeah? Schizophrenia demons are far more powerful than loss of demons, fear demons, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, they're demons on steroids. His wife is sitting right there, doesn't hear what I said, but heard me say, you don't have any faith. That's what she heard me say. I said to the guy, your faith level is here, but that's not good enough. We can't get that demon out of there. Uh, we've got to get your faith level up here. We've got to improve it and increase it, is what I said to him. But she heard me say, she heard me say, you guys don't have any faith. She got mad, jumped out of her seat, and bolted out of my office. <laughs> mad as a hornet. <laughs> yeah. It didn't bother me at all. I've seen it happen many times before. I just blew it off and kept going with the, with the husband. The guy I was trying to help and his son. I was trying to help the son. But once you start listening to demons over and over, by the way, that wife uh, had been raised in a Jehovah's Witness setting. 
her parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. And as I, as I just mentioned, Jehovah Witness demons are similar to schizophrenia demons. They are demons on steroids. They are extremely powerful deceivers. Jehovah Witnesses is a massive satanic cult loaded with fake false doctrines. I mean, you can't. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses are battling out, battling it out with Mormons for the most asinine, insane, false doctrines you've ever heard. I mean, it's all a pack of gigantic lies. And they believe it. They believe it's true. That's how powerful these demons are. They are so smart. Well, she jumped out of my, out of the chair and all, and just bolted for the door. She was mad at me. She was mad at me the rest of the time they were there. She bad-mouthed me on social media. I mean, just everything. It all, it all went bad. It was fine for me. I, I don't have a problem with it. But I'm telling you that story to give you an idea of how these spirits operate. I wasn't mad at her because I know it was a Jehovah Witness spirit telling her, I'm a cult. She wrote on social media that I, I was an occult. <laughs> I was a cult leader. You know, if I'm a cult leader, I'm a very poor one because I, I do a poor job in recruiting people. <laughs> I can't get anybody to come to the services or watch these podcasts. So I'm not doing a good job as a cult leader. I'm kind of failing. But I wasn't mad at her and it didn't even bother me what she did because I already knew from years of experience who was talking to me. And it wasn't that poor lady. It was not her talking to me. It was them. They were talking to me. They attacked me on social media. They ran me down. They hate me. They hate me. So once you understand and know that your enemy in life, as Paul said in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not. Your enemy in life is not people. It's not the natural world. It's actually beings in the invisible world. It's the invisible world. It's the prince, the ruler, and the authority of the air. Spirit beings transition, as Paul said, through the air or the atmosphere where the air is, the oxygen. That's how they move. They move back and forth. They don't walk around like I do or like an animal does. They don't do that. They transition through there. You know, kind of like ghosts in movies. Some of them don't walk. They just float places. No. And that's how it is. That's how they move. That's what Paul said. But it doesn't matter where a demon's moving to or going or anything like that. That's not our problem. We can't control that anyway, but your mind and who controls your mind determines everything about you as a person and everything about your future. Where will you be five years from now? That depends on one thing. Who controls your mind? Now, remember this truth. Everything in this earth, everything everywhere, anywhere, you cannot control. You have no control over it. Or you have limited control over it. Okay? So I'm wearing a shirt here. I put a T-shirt on this morning. I'm wearing a pair of shorts. Uh, I have control over these shorts and over this shirt. But I don't have total control over everything. I can't disintegrate these shorts by looking at them. I can't cause these the shirt to burn off. I got limitations, total limitations over everything on this planet. And I am not in control, total control over anything on this planet. Nothing. I cannot control another person totally. I cannot control a computer. I can't control anything totally. And God never gave me everything in this world that I would be in under control of it. I don't have control of it. But God did give you one thing that you are in total control over, and that is your mind. Each person, assuming they don't have a disability, each normal person, 
has control over their mind and no one else has it. God wants to control your mind, but he'll only do it by permission if you yield it over voluntarily of your own free will. Demons don't do that. They don't care about your free will. They're going to try to trick you, lie to you, steal from you, crush you, anything to control your mind. They'll do anything in this world to try and control your mind. And so your mind, in a way, is kind of like a filter. Thoughts come into your mind from God. Thoughts come into your mind from demons. Thoughts come into your mind from other people. Thoughts enter your mind while you're reading something, absorbing it with your vision and your mind. And then you decide of your own free will in your mind whether you will keep what you heard or saw or read or not. You determine this is your filter in life. And God gave you your filter to be owned 100% by you and to be 100% controlled by you. You can do anything with your mind that you choose to do. And so when God says, choose this day whom you will serve, right? That's what Joshua said. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He chose of his own free will in his mind to serve Yahweh or Jehovah, right? God didn't force him to do it. Demons, on the other hand, will tell you what to do. Get upset, get mad, take an offense. They will put thoughts in your mind to trigger your emotions, negative emotions, to try to control you and manipulate you like a puppet. You can control somebody's body through their mind. You can control somebody's emotions through their mind. Correct? Yeah. Um, if you're going to tap into some porn tonight, you do it first mentally. In your mind, you have a sexual fantasy, an interest or a desire that you created in your mind. And then you go to Pornhub and bang, there it is. See that? Your mind controlled the behavior of your fingers on the keyboard. Bang, Pornhub's up. And the demons then go, thanks for letting us in. Boop, and in they come into your mind from Pornhub. They love porn. It's your mind that determines where you will be five years from now. And it's your mind that determines what happens to your future. It's not God. God would prefer you accept his future for you, which is fantastic. Your ministry, your anointing, your blessings, they're all there. They're all there. I taught on it Friday night, 45 minutes. I taught about grace, the grace of God. We are in the dispensation. I own or age of grace. And you can have anything and everything from God that you can believe for right now. Now, in the future, you know, after the rapture, that's another story. I don't want to get into that. But now, right now, where we are, you can have anything from God that you can believe for. And it's up to you. It's up to you. Choose this day whom you will serve. Right? That's what Jehovah said to the Jews. Yeah. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and do what is right in his sight, and keep his precepts, Follow his commandments. He says, if you will do that, I will put none of these diseases upon you. I put upon the Egyptians. For I am Yahweh Rafka. I am the eternal God who heals you. But healing was left up to the Jews. Your healing is left up to you. Your salvation is left up to you. 
your deliverance is left up to you. The benefits have already been purchased at Calvary. Jesus plans, plain and simple, set it, point blank range. Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. There's your healing right there. <laughs> there it is. Time to get healed. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but send his son into the world to save the world. So, so deliver the world. There's your deliverance right there. But God's not going to force it on you. He's not going to make you get delivered or healed. He's not going to force you to get saved. God doesn't work with androids or cyborgs. He likes humans. He loves humans. Humans that reject him or what? Heartbreakers. I mean, that kills him. Every person that dies and goes to hell, he has to feel the pain in his heart. Knowing how sensitive he is and loving is, I'm sure every every one of them he notices. We know that for an absolute fact because Jesus said, look at all these sparrows. Not one of them dies without your father, Heavenly Father, noticing it. A sparrow, a bird. He notices everything. Now, if a bird dies or an insect dies or a plant dies, I don't think, in my mind, uh, God doesn't get heartbroken over it. But when a human being dies and goes to hell, I think that hurts him. That stings. Because that was a person that God wanted. He didn't want the plant or the insect that died. He, wanted, he wants people. He's a people person. That's who he likes. People person. He's a you type person. But He's got incredible feelings, a very emotional person. Father is a very emotional person. And when you sit there and a demon puts a thought in your mind that's sinful, stupid, or asinine, and you go with it, oh, man, that hurts him. That hurts him. Because the Holy Spirit was trying to get a thought in your mind and couldn't do it because the demonic thought that you received blocked it out. You are the gatekeeper of what enters your mind, what you read, what you see, what you do, what you watch. You are the gatekeeper of what you believe, what you decide, what your future will be. You're the person who decides. You demand. Yeah. Now, God wants to be the man. He wants to make your decisions for you. He wants him. He'll do it. Be happy to do it. He loves to do it. But he only does it if he's asked to do it. See? So you're, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your enemies in life are not your relatives, friends, spouses, or coworkers. They are not your enemies. Those people are being used by the invisible world. And those people are attacking you or disappointing you or, or abandoning you or hurting you. They're doing it for a reason. And it's not the reason you think it is. It's coming from the invisible world through them to get to you. And that's why your brother and sister, your mom and dad, that's why they're barnyard crazy. That's why your spouse acts a fool. Come on. They're being manipulated. They're being controlled. You know, like puppets, puppet show. How are they being controlled? Supernaturally, physically? No. The devil puts a thought in that person's mind. Say that to this person. And they come up and they say the dumbest thing, the hurtful, most hurtful thing you've ever heard. Some completely asinine thing falls out of their mouth, blah, spills over you like vomit. And the devil's standing there watching you. Are they going to take it? How are they going to respond to it? If they take it, then tell her to say this. Okay. And this week in the counseling session I had with that family, as I just told you, that woman got up, and, you know, I didn't receive any of that because I knew where it was coming from. And I didn't have any bad feelings about her at all. 
Dildo, I wish you would come in for prayer. I wish you would come in for some hugs and kisses. I'll crank out some hugs and kisses for her. Absolutely. I, I, I mean it. I'm dead serious. I have no hard feelings at all for anybody who gets mad at me because I'm because uh, I already know what's happening. See, once you know what's happening, God's people die for lack of knowledge. Once you have this knowledge and you apply it, you're immune to being beaten. You can't be beaten. Once you get the knowledge and apply it, that's called wisdom. Once you have knowledge and wisdom, you're unbeatable. So when they wrote a bunch, she wrote a bunch of nasty stuff about me on social media. I read it and go, oh, that's, well, that's not bad. You know, the way I saw it, it could have been worse. I don't receive that. I'm not receiving that. You know, you've heard people say that. Why don't you say it? As I mentioned to you before, you know, the, from the invisible world to the natural world is usually a negative thought. Sometimes it's a positive thought to get you drifted off in, in the wrong direction. The Greek word is planao, to drift off the road. And it's the uh, English word is, is deceiving or deceived, planao, drifting off the road. Once they do that, and they try to get you to drift over here, they'll put in another thought related to that one. That's just as stupid. Oh, they don't like you. Receive it. They're plotting against you. Receive it. They're going to leave you. Receive it. They hate your guts. Receive it. See, as soon as you receive one, then they start front loading your mind with a bunch of other similar thoughts that are just as moronic and just as stupid. If you keep receiving them and you do that over a period of years and you add chemicals to it, like crack or crystal meth or something, pot, pot is the normal one, you can actually let an entity in your head. And then you're going to come down with dissociative identity disorder, severe bipolar, psychosis, schizophrenia, on and on. Those are severe cases, but you're not a severe case, okay? But the principle is the same. The principle is the same. You and a patient with schizophrenia, the principle is the same. The level is different. In a schizophrenia patient, the thoughts are more powerful. The thoughts are more dominant dominating thoughts are more in control than a regular person. But the concept of it is the same. They're injecting thoughts into the person's mind and the person is not taking the thought captive and crushing it at the feet of Jesus Christ. I hate your guts, your spouse said to you. I hate you. And you go, it doesn't matter. My Heavenly Father loves me. So what a person thinks about me is not, not really important. It doesn't matter. I am loved. And so, see, I just took that thought captive there. And then I replaced it with the Word of God. John 3, 16. For God so loved Brother Mike. Right? So... If this person hates me or this person thinks I'm an idiot or they trash me on social media, none of that stuff even affects anything. It doesn't even register with me because I chose to take those thoughts captive and re replace them with God's word that says I am unconditionally, unconditionally loved by God. God loves me even though I failed and sinned and I did this and then I did that. I screwed up and then I screwed down. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I am unconditionally loved, and so are you, and you know that. And you know that. And from now on, when people talk to you, it's going to go right over the top of your head. It doesn't matter what they say to you, good or bad or indifferent. You got this. You're going to do it. You can't lose. Friday night, 7 o'clock Pacific time, 7 o'clock Arizona time. I'll have a seminar on the invisible world. Oh, I got a rack of stuff to share with you that I didn't share today. This is only a sampling of it. But let me tell you, it's very interesting information from God's word, and it's information you desperately need. Because the more you understand about the spirit world, 
the stronger you become and your spiritual warfare skills accelerate dramatically if you understand the spirit world, the invisible world, what is out there that you and I cannot see. But today you're seeing it, whether they be thrones, right? Whether they be thronos, whether they be lordships, whether they be rulers, whether they be spiritual authorities, right? Colossians 1, Ephesians 6. See, all these things are subject to the Lord Jesus and what they say and what they do and the thoughts they give you are subject to your free will. You can receive those thoughts. Oh my God, my husband's cheating on me. Oh my God. My wife's going to clean out the bank account. Okay, you can take those thoughts and keep them. Or you got the free will and the authority of your mind to reject those thoughts and not let them bother your emotions or affect your behavior. Thoughts affect emotions and behaviors. And that's how demons control human beings. Through their thoughts, manipulating their emotions, and initiating behaviors, right? That's exactly how it works. Fantasy lust thoughts, right? Lustful passions, emotions, and then behaviors, born up. It all started here in the mind. And Friday night, seven o'clock, I hope you'll join me. Now it's gonna be, from a technical standpoint, very interesting. You'll be very happy you joined. I will be too, because I love you.